and in the appropriation accounts, I just want to start with the asylum yes. uh, process and your area of expertise, really, um, in the years that you've been justice, one of them anyway. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. Um, and maybe go through some of the figures and some of the policy announcements that have been made recently, um, particularly as it pertains to fast-tracking applicants. Um, and maybe let, I'll start with that. Yeah. Okay? okay. Now, you know, doing a bit of research into this, we go back and you, uh, you, you see press reports about this having been announced, certainly having been announced in the media back in April of this year, that a fast-track process um, was being formulated within the department. Um, it's been re-announced, I don't know how many times. And you know, every time there is a lot of media scrutiny and exposure uh, when it comes to the refugee crisis that exists and has grown over the last six months in Europe, um, we again hear the, the issue of fast-tracking and processing people an awful lot quicker, um, et cetera, et cetera. So where is the, the fast-tracking of applicants as it stands right now. Okay. Thank you, Deputy. I think, I think what you may be referring to there is a piece of legislation which has been in the long, a long time in the making, and it's called the International Protection uh, Bill, uh, which we tidy up uh, the not fit for purpose uh, uh, legislation which we have at the moment, which owes its origin to the Refugee Act of 1996, which is a time consuming, sequential as I say, not fit for purpose piece of legislation. The new International Protection Bill will require people when making applications to put all their, all their details up on the table pretty much immediately when they're making their applications. One of the effects of the old, the current system we're operating is that there are very, there are possibly up to five, maybe six, and maybe more in, in some circumstances, opportunities for people to seek to judicially review decisions which are taking in the system, which has given rise to clearly very serious delays. So there are, really, there are four parts to the process yeah, potentially, yeah. and then you can have a high court appeal, right? And or, or, literally at every every decision point in the system, as it currently stands, uh, people are entitled to go before the high court, and they do that on a regular basis, and that's their entitlement. That's right. the law. Okay. The new the new bill uh, will remove that. Uh, there will be two points of decision in the system, uh, which will remove that immediately. That bill, as I say, is a long time in the making. It was part of a wider piece of legislation which was comp contemplated for reform of the entire uh, immigration area, and the Minister decided upon taking office in, in, in May of last year to separate out the protection aspect of it, and that's been done, and the publication of that is imminent, I have to say. Um, I anticipate that the government will be making a decision on it very, very shortly. And the intention is that it will be then published, then be brought before the Oireachtas, and uh, ideally and hopefully, and I think the Minister is on the record of saying this, she would wish it to be enacted uh, before the end of this session. Okay, Grant, so what, what are we looking at? I mean, as far as um, people, you know, remaining in the system for years and years, and, you know, I'm from Waterford, and, you know, the direct provision centres are in Tremor. Um, I deal with a lot of people who are, we'll say, in the system, having applied for refugee status. Um, so what are we going to look at? Or what will we be looking at when it comes to timelines here, when somebody applies? Um, obviously, there is an appeals process and all of this, but I think what the public really wants to know as well, how quickly okay. will someone be processed? Yeah. Just to put a bit of little context around this, Deputy, at the moment, under our existing system, uh, the first two aspects of the process, people are trued within a median time of about eight months. So when you apply, apply for asylum, and uh, you get a decision, uh, if, obviously if you get it, and the numbers, I should add, by the way, of people getting it are, are on the increase, it's now about of the order of 12, 13% of people who yeah, actually I'll get apply. to that, I have the figures, yeah, okay. I'm just going to, okay. yeah, okay. Okay, I'll come back to that. So the medium time, uh, if, they, if they refuse at first instance, and then they go on to appeal, uh, that decision is made pro ordinarily in about eight months. Uh, the difficulty in our current system then is beyond that, where they then make application under what's known as subsidiary protection, and it starts effectively the whole process all over again. And then when that process is completed, they can then seek to make application to leave to remain in the country. So what's, I understand and, that, what's yeah. going to be different about What's going to be different now in the new system is that people will be required uh, at the moment of making application, at the very point of making application, to uh, put forward every single ground by which they're claiming protection in the state every single ground. They will not be allowed back into the system at a later stage on the basis that they, as a, new, a new ground has emerged. They will be required from the work go to make, put up all their information 
onto the system to make applications. So that won't prevent them from applying? If they put on information and it's... Is that... Will there be an actual an automatic bar in some Absolutely. cases? Absolutely. There, there, there will be statutory requirement on them to do that. And if, if they don't uh, abide by that, uh, effectively there will be... Give me an example with regard to what they're will be asked to fill out well, and what those statutory bars will be? Well, for example, at the moment, if, if, if somebody applies for asylum and they claim under, under the grounds that uh, they're, they're, uh, they're um, uh, being oppressed because of their religion and their okay. home country, and it's found that, uh, no, that, that's not to be the case, then they go on under appeal uh, and it's found to be not the case. Then under subsidiary protection, they go on to make an application on the basis that uh, they have a fear of returning to their country. Uh, so to decide uh, on, you know, to take the grounds for uh, their being discriminated on grounds their religion, do you actually do an investigation of the country uh, from in, which they've come? There is a very large process with a large number of people involved in this. It's an independent process uh, run by the Office of the Refugee Application Commissioner, who is an independent officer of the Minister and of the Department, while, while part of the Department. They do what's known as country of origin research in a very, a very large way. Uh, they're also very much part of the UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees training programme. That's all been very well established and there is a, a very large amount of information available to people in the department in terms of documentation, in terms of access to the information about countries uh, and that's very well established. We started off very poorly on that maybe 10 years ago but by now we have extensive documentation around that process. Let's go back Sorry. to base to your grant. Yep. Um, so what's different with regard to what, what you're proposing? What we're proposing now is that that person in making the application will be required to say, I wish to claim asylum in Ireland on the basis of, of, of uh, I'm, I'm persecuted because of my religion and my country. But, and I also wish to make it clear that I am fearful about returning to my country. They will be required to do that on the spot not as two different separate processes. And if they don't do that uh, and their appeal is upheld, they're, they're, there is no more uh, room for them to be part of the system. Okay. So that's the end of it then? Yes, exactly. So then what are we talking about? Are we talking about increased deportations then? It, clearly, that would be a function of the number of people who actually do come through the process. But ultimately, the, the ultimate gain of this for everybody, for, for Ireland, for the taxpayer, is that people will be processed through the system far more quickly. In, clearly in cases where uh, they do qualify, they could be processed and be recognised as refugees, or they will now be known as uh, protection applicants within a matter of weeks. That could, will happen. And I come to you in that respect in, in the people coming to us now from Syria by invitation of the government and the relocation process. That will happen in a matter of weeks uh, in many cases. In other cases, there is no reason whatsoever why these applications won't be dealt with and out of the system in a matter of months. Our target around that will be between six and nine months that we should be able to do that, which will then mean that people will not be, uh, continue to be housed for very lengthy periods of direct provision. The reason they're there in very, very many cases at the moment is that the delays in the system because of the, of the, the sequential nature of it, because of the multiple opportunities people have to apply before the courts. Fair enough. Okay, you mentioned it, uh, I'm going to refer to it now, basically the refugee grant rates, yes. okay? Well, the figures I have in front of me are 2011 is 3.3%, 2012 5.6%, 2013 it was 11.4%. Um, can you give me an idea what the 2014 and to date 2015 numbers are? And can you explain, you mentioned it yourself, but it had gone up to 12.6% I think you mentioned. Why? Has it gone from 3.3% to 12, over 12? The rate for, 20, for, for a grant for 2014 is 12.6. Okay. Um, essentially, there is no mathematical formula around this. Uh, people present, make application, they either qualify or they don't. Um, it, it really, in the finish, is a function of where people are applying from. Our system in more recent years has seen very many more people applying from refugee-generating countries. That wasn't always the case. So, hence, if people are applying in Ireland from countries which do generate refugees, well, obviously, they will, they will be... Uh, they will, uh, but the last figures I saw, when there was a dull question, it came from the department, showed that the increase when it came to people applying for asylum were from countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Yes, this is, yes definitely. This is, a, this is a feature of this year, and from late last year, there has been a very large... Uh, if I just go back over the figures so over recent years... That doesn't quite equate with what you just said. I'm, we're talking about this year. We're talking okay. about this year. Okay. Uh, 
Paki people from Pakistan uh, up to the end of September, to the best of my recognition or my knowledge, uh, about 1,500 people had applied uh, from Pakistan for asylum in Ireland. Uh, they would have made they, that would have been about 40, 45 percent of all applicants in our system at that stage. Or we we are likely uh, to have about three and a half thousand, maybe three thousand eight hundred applicants this year, which would be an increase, a very large increase from the last number of years. In what was first the increase from last year? So three thousand eight hundred. In 2013, it was about 950 or thereabouts. Last year, I think it was of the order of about 1,200. Okay. And uh, it's now up to uh, likely to be three thousand eight hundred. Now, of those, you're saying that those two countries amount they, they will constitute forty-five percent of those applications. It, by years, then the likelihood is that they probably will. They probably will. Uh, now, people have actually just stick with that for a second. Yeah. People have intimated to me that some of the the individuals coming from Pakistan and Bangladesh have already been processed in the UK system. And what they do is they come to Northern Ireland, for example, and then they cross the border. It being one free travel area. Is that something that you've seen yourself? Yeah. I, I want, if I may, Deputy, talk on the generality of it here, yeah. because clearly people have a statutory and a lawful entitlement to claim for claim asylum, and so I don't want in any way, any sense to be... And I don't either, that's uh, fair uh, enough, yeah. Cut across correct, any yeah. individual application. Yeah. No, I'm, but, just, but, I'm, yeah. I'm actually citing the countries yeah. that the department cited to me, so yeah, sure. that's why I'm mentioning them, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, what, what seems to be happening, and which is a concern for us, is that people who uh, are in the UK, that the, the applicant uh, cohort we're talking about, from those countries tend to be uh, young males in their early to mid twenties, maybe a little older, who have effectively, in many cases, and we're able. To, this is one of the benefits of our our common travel area system, where we can check with our colleagues in the UK if they have already status, immigration status in the UK. In many cases, uh, these are people who might have arrived at the UK as students, uh, who have now run out of time in uh, in in their immigration status, and uh, in order to remain within the common travel area, Ireland and the UK, uh, would come to Ireland, make application here, uh, in some instances remain, uh, and in some instances, uh, when their application is dealt with, would have disappeared back into the system. But it is uh, a concern and... Uh, well, surely it's an awful waste of resources, when you consider that basically they've gone through the UK process. Well, they wouldn't, I, I would say, Debbie, they haven't gone through the UK asylum process by and large. They would have been in the UK on a different uh, yeah, yeah, immigration yeah. route. Yeah. Uh, but I agree, I agree. But for all that, uh, it, we have a statutory uh, duty uh, for everybody who turns up to claim asylum. I know, I'll tell you where I, but I'll tell you where I'm coming from. And I, it's probably a view that's, I, I, I guess, shared universally almost, certainly within the department. I mean, there is a refugee crisis in, you know, in Europe right now. And we have finite resources. And we've had. And, and, the, and the strain and the stress that, you know, comparably, you know, compared to Germany, for example, um, we, we haven't seen the kinds of pressures that the Germans are experiencing right now. Berlin, I think they're processing a thousand people per day in that city. Yes. So when I, when you say something like that to me, uh, I think about the people who actually are genuine uh, refugees, who kind of deserve attention, deserve accommodation, and, and you know, deserve governments um, looking at them differently. And what we're dealing with here um, seems to me to be people who are, frankly, spuriously in many cases, applying for refugee status, and that seems to be a hallmark of our system down through the years, when you look at the, the rates that you've just cited. Right? And you mentioned yourself, okay, the numbers of genuine, we'll say, refugees are going up, it's reflected in the grant rates for refugees, but the question does arise, you know, outside of your fast-tracking process, how effective will that be? Um, and, you know, we'll go back to, you know, how much money we spend in this area and where it needs to be allocated. And when you have this kind of increase, up to 3,800 from 900 a couple of years ago, um, we have a problem. And the problem is the money isn't going where it should be. Um, yeah. It is. Right. Respondent, yes, please, yes. could you also uh, address the issue of what happens to those who have been refused uh, sure. by Trimay? Uh, I, I share uh, deputies' concerns in this respect. Um, uh, it, it is a difficulty, and we're not alone in that respect. I think all administrations um, uh, you know, sh have those difficulties. I think, uh, from our department's view, the staff are, you know, work very hard 
to try uh, as quickly as possible identify the people who are people in need of protection from among the large number of people to try and get them through the system get them out the far side of the system as quickly as possible get them into living you know proper and appropriate lives in the community supporting them as best they can with all the measures and that clearly has to be the focus and yes i agree you know, people who do make application and do use who do use the system uh, for the reasons you describe are, are a difficulty i would add that uh, as you know the government has agreed to take in 4000 people from as a result of the conflict in, 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 in the Middle East. Sure. Uh, that is an entirely different situation. These people, while they will be subject to the new process we're talking about, the, the sense is that 75, 80%, maybe even higher, will automatically qualify because they are clearly coming from Syria and the region where refugees are being generated. So there's no reason why they can't be through the system very quickly and they will be, in every sense of the word, people who do deserve uh, you know, our, 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 our hospitality. Uh, on the chairman's point about what happens to people um, um, uh, who do not qualify, a much misunderstood part of our system is that um, when a person has been through the entire process, uh, they're invited in the, in the ultimate to make application as to why they should remain in the state on humanitarian grounds and they've put forward a case and this will this again will be gone in the new in the new system and uh, if that's not accepted by the minister uh, and, and it's done by officials on the on, on the minister's behalf in, in most cases uh, there then a deportation order is then signed uh, telling them they must leave the country the onus is on the individual to leave the country in front of the deportation order. The onus isn't on the state to remove the person forcibly from the country. And that, that is a very, it's, it's an important distinction. But uh, some people do leave the country. Uh, by definition, it's very difficult to say how many would at any given time, because immigrant communities, and given you know, being what they are, and given our free travel area between ourselves and the UK, uh, but some people do, but many people don't, and the Gardaí then are faced with a very difficult, uh, uh, deci not decision, but task, along with our staff, of forcibly removing people. And that, you know, is a very unpleasant uh, duty for everybody to have to do, and it wouldn't be our wish to do it, but in order to maintain the integrity of any immigration system, uh, you have to have forcible deportations where it's warranted. Another difficulty... Would actually leave, do you think? Or you uh, probably don't know. But I mean. it's, it's very, very difficult to say. Uh, um, but we did an exercise a number of years ago, um, four or five or, or years ago, and our books at the time showed that we had approximately, uh, the books in theory, that we had approximately, I think if it was about 10, maybe 11,000 people on our books uh, who had an application in the system. So we had an exercise to clean up uh, the records around that. And when, it, when, it, when we had done everything we had to do, it turned out that the actual live case load was of nearer to 6,000. So the other people had disappeared uh, somewhere into the system, more than likely, and the Gardaí would tell us, more than likely they would have left the country and probably would have gone back to the UK. But alongside that, as I say, we do have forcible uh, removals and deportations. There are, there are a number of... Uh, of different categories of people who are removed and about of the number of deportation orders that are signed ordinarily about 15 to 20 percent of them are forcibly removed uh, there's another difficulty which will be addressed in the protection legislation which is to be approved by the government obviously i expect it to be done very very quickly very shortly is that there was a high court judgment uh, which found that the Gardaí who do enforce these orders uh, had no right to enter a person's private dwelling uh, to seek to remove somebody from it. So that clearly presents a problem, has presented a problem for a, for a number of months for us. It's the, what's known as the Omar judgment. So meaning in effect that, that, that uh, 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 you know, when the Gardaí would, would seek to, to enforce the order that a person would then say, I'm sorry, you're in my private residence, you have no right to come in here, uh, and if you do, I will, you know, I, will, I will go to the High Court. And that is a practical difficulty, and as I say, we're addressing that uh, in the... question arises, if you take, you know, and you've mentioned, I've mentioned a couple of nationalities that were in the responses I got from the department. So somebody from the public will ask a question then. If one of those individuals, because it's a common travel area, mm. is found to apply for asylum, yes. okay? Yes. Well, how different will it be in the, new, uh, in the new system? It seems to me that those numbers, that number of 3,800, you know, com compared to other European countries, mm. it's not massive. Mm. 
but it's growing quite a bit. Okay? It, it is growing. That's, that's it's growing four, fourfold since, yeah. for, since two years ago. Yeah. So what's the difference going to be when it comes to treating people who are, I mean, you know, not processed, we'll say, in the UK system, but where through the UK system to a certain extent, they come in through the north. Um, how will that be different once this legislation is enacted? It, it will mean that they will not have the opportunities they have at the moment, the five, six, and maybe more in some cases, opportunities to go to the High Court and to seek judicial review. It wouldn't be unusual. Uh, although less or so in more recent times, for somebody literally on the steps of a plane being removed by the Gardaí uh, to seek a High Court relief to stop a person being removed. That, that wouldn't have been unusual down through, the, down through the period. And you can never rule that out happening. And you know, people have a right to go to the courts. But we are removing the opportunities for people to do that as best we can. There's also a wider issue happening here in what's known as the Dublin Regulation where people are, and you will be aware of this from the, the, the current issue around Europe, where people are expected and required to make their application in their first country, and then if they don't, sure. they, are, they have to be removed. Now, that's not working very well in any country in Europe, uh, because uh, the, the, the arrangements around there are very complex. People have to be given opportunities to appeal. Uh, it's, it's, it can work better where you can detain people. We don't detain people in Ireland. That's a matter of policy. We don't do that, say, for very short periods pending the removal. I'm going to say short periods, days uh, at, at most. But that, that, that's part of the process, too. So the, the onus on the individual within this legislation, yes. Okay. Yes. You know, with keeping in mind everything to do with our finances and yes. the resources that we have, mm. the onus to deport themselves yes. effectively. Yes. But it's not going to change in this legislation, or is it? No, no. The, the onus will always be on the person on foot of a deportation order to leave the state on the deportation order. And have you any idea how, how many times, what's the percentage with regard to how, how many people actually leave the country once a de deportation order has been issued? As I, as I indicated earlier, uh, we did an exercise. It's very difficult to by, by definition sure. to, yeah, because yeah. people can travel freely. And the route, I should add, by the way, is the uh, favourite route now is uh, uh, from the north across to Scotland and down, as it is on the way back in. Uh, hitherto would have been from, uh, from Dublin on the ferry route or on, from, from okay. Ross Lair, uh, but those routes are, are, are closed off. And we've an added difficulty, obviously, in that if somebody leaves the UK from Scotland to the Northern Ireland, they're still coming into the uh, UK. Uh, none of us want to be in a position where we are reintroducing border controls uh, at Dundalk or anywhere else. That clearly is not an option. So there are practical difficulties in respect of, of and, and, you know, policing that area. But as I say, we, 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 have, we, we don't have figures by definition about people who leave. But you did an exercise and you've got we a did, fair we idea. Did, so we did an exercise. What did you come up with? We, what we came up with, as I said, we had, we, I think of the order of 10, maybe 11,000 people who were on the books uh, who needed to, who were cases still weren't processed. But when we went to them and found that we wrote to them and wrote to them subsequently and wrote to their legal advisors of the order of five, six thousand of people uh, was the real live caseload. And most of those would have been outside the direct provision system. So you're saying half of them left? Uh, the, that would have been our experience at that point in time. At that point in and time. When was that? This would have been in 2012. Okay. 2012, 2013. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep going, okay? Because. Yeah. A certain amount of time, you know, there's no one else here, so sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> circumstance, you can go on. Okay. Can I just, sorry, just before you move on, to ahead, the area, ahead, can ahead. I just ask in relation to, to the, what, what's the, when the new legislation comes in, what's likely to happen to the people who have been in the system for, say, six or seven years? As you will be aware, Chairman, the government set up a working group to look at the entire uh, direct vision system uh, earlier on, late, late last year, and it reported uh, in the summer of this year, and it came up with, I think, of the order of 170 recommendations uh, to deal with people in the system in direct vision. And uh, clearly, one of, the, one of the major issues to be addressed uh, is the, number, the length of time people are in the direct vision system. And I think everybody, well, maybe not everybody, but, you know, uh, the, the real difficulty with the direct provision system is the length of time people are in it. And our focus at the moment is trying to deal with the cases of people who are there longer than five years and get them out of the system and move them <coughs> out. And in the ideal world, when the new legislation is turned on, we would have reduced that caseload to the absolute minimum because it would be an entirely unhappy situation for us to be operating two parallel systems. One where people were being, as Deputy DC says, fast-tracked to the system, and others, people who were already in the system and uh, 
uh, you know, they were, they were log jammed in it. But each case would be, uh, would be dealt with on its merits. We are often asked, for example, you know, would, should these be uh, subject to an amnesty or amnesti amnestized? And obviously that's a matter for, uh, for the government to decide. But I have no sense whatsoever uh, that there would be an amnesty to deal with those cases. We have always been open. Uh, and there are di practical difficulties and political difficulties in terms of the European uh, agenda around that too, and that no country uh, is in a position to move forward individually around that because a person who gets status in one country in, in Europe can ultimately move into another country, and that obviously gives rise to major difficulties when you're talking about very large numbers of people. Uh, so there is a political agreement that there shouldn't be any general uh, 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 regulation schemes. but. Ireland, like other countries, we, on a case-by-case -case basis, where somebody puts forward a good case on humanitarian grounds as to why they, uh, they should, be, should remain, uh, we will look at it, and we have, we have done it, and we've done it uh, in increasing numbers in recent months on foot of the Working Group report, with the aim of ensuring that we get as many people out of the system who are there for a lengthy period as quickly as possible.